Well, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. How many of you guys are family people? <laughs> eh, how many of you, not so much? Yeah, <laughs> the teenagers are like, nah. Not so much. The family. Well, if you're here today, we want to thank you for being here. If this is your first time, we want to welcome you to our family. If you're not a believer today, we hope that today you hear about the love of Christ and you experience the love of Christ and you give your life to Christ. This is why we exist and what we are all about. And we're on this series about Welcome to the Family and we're going through Acts. We're looking at what happened in the beginning at the first family? I mean, what really took place? And so we're going to be looking at five things that that church did that uh, really revolutionized uh, the faith. What, what took place in that time? And last week, Preston did a great job of talking about what it means to be a witness, how we're to be a witness before we're to think of ourselves as being Christians. I know that's hard to believe, but being a witness is oftentimes much harder than saying you're a Christian. But you ever ask yourself, why were these guys such incredible witnesses? I mean, why were they so amazing? Think about this. They knew that Jesus had lived. They knew Jesus himself. They knew the truth about all that had happened. This is this entire book of Acts. These guys are the witnesses. They're the ones in the beginning. They knew he had lived. They knew he had died. They knew he had been buried. They knew he had risen again. They knew they, they had conversations with him. I mean, they knew. Now, if you and I had experienced that, do you think our lives would have been different? Well, for the next four weeks, we're going to kind of look at that. How did 120 people transform the world? How did they have courage, confidence, commitment? How did they change the world? How did they have the power to do these things? Heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead, speak with authority on who Jesus was, endure persecution, leave their homes, sell their belongings, share with the good news with everybody they came in contact with. Man, how did they navigate conflict and stay in unity? And how were they radically transformed to be different people? That is what we want to know. And the reason why we want to know it is because that's what our desire is. So how did they do that? How did they do that? One simple phrase. They were on fire. I want you to remember this. They were on fire, not a campfire, not a bonfire. No, they were raging on fire. Have you ever witnessed a fire out of control? How many of you ever have seen a fire out of control? Man, I'll tell you what, on news lately, we see California burning down. I'm not going to say why, but we'll just say it. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Man, you see those fires and you're like, they are all consuming, burning things, tearing the countryside up. This is the kind of fire that these early church people had. Now, I remember when I was a young boy, I had an experience, my first experience with a fire. I was out snow machining. I think I've shared the story two times, two separate times. I was out snow machining and uh, I, I, was, I was driving through this little area that where there are trailers. And I don't know if you've ever seen a trailer fire, but it was Christmas both times. It was Christmas time. And I was driving through the neighborhood and a trailer caught on fire. And I'm telling you what, it was incredible. And so I ran down to the caretaker. I found him. And I said, hey, listen, there's a, there's a trailer on fire. And so he ran to the fire and he shows up with a garden hose. He says, hey, you got to go. You got to go back and try to get the fire department to show up. Well, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Just so you know, Seldovia, we are a long ways from town. So I get on the phone and, and I, thought I, I, I had to break into the office because I lost the key. Ever been so nervous as a 13-year-old, you, 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 you freak out? That's what I did. He had given me the key to the office. I got to the key. I'm shaking so bad I drop it. It's, and then it, it lands on, a, on the deck and goes through the crack. I thought, they're not going to blame me for breaking the window. So I just smash the window out and jump inside. I get on the phone. I call the fire department. And in Seldovia, we're a small town. And so the guy that answers is a classmate of mine. His name was Frankie. And I said, hey, Frankie, there is a fire 
out here at the, at the logging mill. We need you to get out here immediately, okay? Thanks, bye, click. Off I run back to the fire. I get to the fire. Herb and I, we're trying to put this thing out. It's not possible. The thing is just going up. We're thinking it's going to burn the whole neighborhood down. Scariest thing ever. The fire pretty much, the trailer burns to the ground. All of a sudden we notice a plane flies by. I'm like, that's odd. Sure enough, he flies by. We're still sitting there. We really don't know what to do. We're kind of just cleaning up. The fire department shows up. I'm like, thank you for showing here. Isn't that how it normally works? You know, no, don't, uh, sorry, fireman. I didn't really mean to say that. But, uh, <laughs> so the, fi the fireman says, uh, hey, next time when you call 911, you should say who you are. I said, like, how many people call the fire department? He's, we didn't know if it was, we get prank calls all the time. And I just, I thought to myself, oh dear, this is not good. So what did I do? I just assumed Frank knew my name, knew my voice and said, hey, listen, there's a fire hung up and go. I didn't have time to stick around. The reality was I didn't take the time to actually convey the information. Listen, when we find ourselves in this world and we, we, we understand the power of fire, we've got to take notes. We've got to pay attention because fire is an amazing thing. It's the most powerful thing I believe is out there. And this church, this church experiences this fire of the Spirit of God, and it transforms the world. It literally is going to transform the world, and it's here to transform us today. This Pentecostal fire is what was happening in the first church. It was a fire that was unstoppable. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to dive in, and we're going to find out what in the world took place. How did this family change the world? How did they change the world? Let's start reading Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says this. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire that appeared to them and rested on each of them. Now notice two interesting things, that the Spirit of God showed up in a mighty rushing wind and the appearance of fire on their shoulders or on them. And so what is the significance? What is wind all about? Why does God use the wind to describe the Spirit? Well, wind is from the heavens, just so you know. The wind moves as it will, so does the Spirit. Nobody commands the wind except God, by the way. Not all the carbon credits of the world will not stop the wind. The wind is mysterious. Jesus, when speaking to Nicodemus, explains that without the wind, the, without the spirit, there is no transformation. Notice this in John chapter 3 and verse 5. Jesus has this conversation. He says this, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I've said this to you. You must be born again. You must be born in the Spirit. And then he says this, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You see, the Spirit was described as wind. But not only that, the, the spirit is described oftentimes as fire. Now, fire, I believe, is the most powerful thing that exists. Like I said, if you've witnessed a fire out of control, it is amazing to see the power of a fire. Think about this. The stars are fire. They are on fire. I promise you anything that gets close to our sun is consumed Fire is awesome. It illuminates in darkness. The spirit exposes sin as light in darkness. Fire draws and grabs the attention of people. Have you ever noticed something? When there's smoke, there's fire. And when there's fire, there's people. What happens? The whole neighborhood comes out just drawn like a, uh. How many of you guys have seen the northern lights? They've been all over, right? Everybody's like, ah. Uh. The heaven, the stars, you look at the sun. The sun comes out. What does everybody do? Ah. Oh. We are drawn to the sun. 
Man, not only that, fire produces an intense warmth. Praise God it does in Mexico, by the way. Fire also, listen, consumes what it touches. Fire consumes what it touches. The spirit will consume us and transform who we are. Listen, it reveals the work in us. Why is, does God use fire as the spirit? Notice this in 1 Corinthians 3.13 at the end. Each one will give a, an account, a manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. Listen, every one of us, when we give an account before God, our works will be revealed by fire. The spirit will try them. Why? The spirit within us, he's with us, by the way, as we go about our work, it will show a reveal by fire our works. Notice, and the fire will test what sort of work each one of us has done. If that work has been built on the foundation, it survives and he will receive a reward. Why? This fire reveals. Not only that, fire transforms the landscape, right? I mean, how many of you have come back after a forest fire and went, oh, wow, we have transformed the landscape. Fire transforms lives. It transforms who we are. And as Christians, we want to be transformed. We don't want to be the same people we were before. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. So you see, once a fire is lit, the fire gives off light. It draws attention to itself. It produces intense heat. It consumes what it touches. It transforms our lives and it is strengthened with the wind. So therefore, we're going to ask ourselves this question, this moment, this moment, is it possible to continue? Now, listen, I want you to understand something. I'm not saying there's going to be a never, another day like Pentecost. There is no more fire falling down on us, just so you know. That already happened. We can't create that any more than we can create Bethlehem again or the crucifixion again. Those things are independent of themselves. Listen, Bethlehem was God with us. Calvary was God for us. The Pentecost is God in us. It's the spirit of God. Our job is to continue what happened on the day of Pentecost and transform the world through the power of the spirit. So what is Pentecost. Did you ever wonder that? Everybody thinks Pentecost is all about when the Spirit came, but Pentecost was something they celebrated all the time. Pentecost was the celebration of Shabbat. And Shabbat was the celebration of the law. And what was the celebration of the law? It was, it was 50 days after uh, the Passover. Why, what was the significance of that? The significance of that, if you remember, in, in Egypt, when they were kept captive, they, they produced the Passover, which gave them the last and final uh, curse that then let them free. Seven weeks later, they find themselves at Mount Sinai, and Moses is giving them the law. That is what Pentecost celebration was all about. So what was happening? No longer would man be made righteous by the law, but now he would be made righteous through the spirit. Now no longer would you have to be in obedience to the law to receive it, but you would be in obedience to the spirit to receive eternal life. It was picked specifically for the reason to show, listen, the law is now gone and now we're in an age of the spirit and the spirit now moves amongst us and he is the one who gives us eternal life through Christ. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Now let's continue to read. Here we go in verse 3. It says this, And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Now think about this tongues of fire. This was, the, this was a picture, an image of the Shekinah of glory. Now this is all really cool as we get into this message. It was a picture of the Shekinah glory of God that was in the temple, was to represent the holy of holies in the temple. It was now taken from the temple and put into you and I. That's what this imagery was. That was a picture of what was taking place. I want you to think about that. Now you are the temple of God. No longer is it in a building, it is in you. You now possess, as a believer in Christ, the glory of God, the spirit of God. He is on your life. Man, I, 
I don't know if you understand this, but back in this day, there was nothing more sacred than the temple. Then there was nothing more sacred than the Holy of Holies, the place in where only the high priest could have one encounter with the living God. Now he walks in you and I, and oftentimes we act as though he doesn't even exist. Corinthians 1, uh, chapter 1, 316 says this, do you not know that you are God's temple? Wow, and that God's spirit dwells within you? Do you understand what's happening here? The first family has been challenged to be a witness. God sends his spirit. He gives this incredible picture of power and might. He shows them how it's no longer about the temple. It's all about the spirit. And now they possess everything they need to transform the world for him. He continues in verse four. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, in other tongues, as the spirit gave them utterance. Why was this so why was this so significant? I mean, what was the, the significance of this moment? So many people, so many faiths uh, struggle with this idea. And, and Baptists, to be honest, you are just afraid to even talk about the day of Pentecost. They're like, oh, that tongue's talking. Yeah. You know it's true. Quit lying to yourself. I don't know why we get so confused here. What was happening was God poured out his spirit and revealed his message, his witness, his plan to those that were there. He used the idea of foreign languages, unknown languages, a miracle to say, listen, I am now giving my spirit to all the earth and I'm revealing it in this fashion. The, listen, the significance wasn't that they were speaking in another language. The significance is that the message was for the entire world. Why do we get confused on the details and miss the broader picture? Listen, this was an incredible message. You want to know how I know that the gift of tongues is not about us in the church? It's not about a picture of the Holy Spirit and our spiritualism? Because 1 Corinthians says what it's all about. We know that it's about the gospel. 1 Corinthians 14, says this, thus tongues is a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Why? It's the unbeliever who didn't know the language. It was a sign to them like, wow, how can you, a, Judea, a person from another country who doesn't even know me, speak in my language and share this incredible story of the gospel? This is supernatural. This is amazing. And this is what was happening. Verse 5 goes on to say this. Now, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews devout under every nation under heaven. Now listen, this is why we know this is the truth. This is the story. You see, because of Shabbat, there were Jews that had been spread out all over the world because of hundreds of years of history. Obviously, we know they got taken into captivity. They're all over the world. And they come together to celebrate the law right at this moment. And this is what's happening. Okay? Verse 6. And at the sound, the multitudes came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in their own language. It was like, hey, listen, this message is for the nations. It drew, listen, notice that the Spirit does, it drew the lost and each heard in their own language. And what did they hear? They heard the good news. That's what they heard. The gift of tongues was to spread the good news. Verse 7 says this, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in his, our own native language, our own native tongue? Wow, think about that. Who were these people? They were from all over the world. Verse 9, the Parthians, the Medes, the Amalites, the residents of Mesopotamia and Judea, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. I should slow down because I can't even pronounce these names. Phygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya going into Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretans, Arab Arabians, the whole known world, hear them telling in their own language the mighty works of God. This is what the picture was. The power of God on the people of God 
to share the gospel of God to the whole world. This is what God was saying. Now listen, verse 13 says this, or verse 12, and all were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? Now notice this verse gets a lot of people confused. But others mocking said, they're filled with new wine. Now, you ever wondered that? Is that because there was just garbage gibberish? Is that because there was just some crazy talking? The answer is no. No, who were the ones mocking? The ones that spoke the Judean language, the Hebrew language, the, the Greek at the time. Those that were there that were the locals were like, what is going on? These people sound like they're crazy. I just want you to know, have you ever listened to some foreign languages? That's what was happening. They were in the middle of a foreign language, hearing foreign languages spoken and thinking, these people have to be drunk with wine. I've never heard this language before. Now, I know many of you guys are pretty amazing in languages, but I'm telling you right now, I've been to some countries where I've never heard the language. And I'm like, "How? Did, who came up with that? And then I'm reminded, oh yeah, God did that. I mean, really, everybody says there's no God. I'm thinking, oh yeah, then... Uh, who was the genius that came up with that language? I mean, who came up with English? I mean, come on. It makes no sense. But then you go to some of these other countries and you're like, okay, Australian, Aborigines languages. You're like, okay, that is crazy talk. Who knows that? How does that make sense? How do those words even mean things? Listen, that's why they said it. It wasn't because it was something supernaturally a different language. No, it was their languages. It was an incredible Holy Spirit moment. They were a church on fire. They were demonstrating the power of God to the message of God for the world of God. Acts chapter 2 verse 14 says this about Peter. Oh, but Peter standing with the 11 lifted up his voice and addressed them said, men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you to give an ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose since only the third hour. Listen, it's the afternoon. They don't drink this quickly. Yeah, some do. But this is what was uttered by the prophet Joel. Let's read it. In the last days it shall be that God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, that your sons and your daughters will, shall prophesy and young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour my spirit and they shall prophesy. They shall preach the word. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is the purpose of all these signs? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The purpose for all of this wonderful things is not glory to self, not glory to God, but the salvation, the message of God, the message of God. And he says this, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. They became a church on fire on fire for one purpose and one purpose only to spread the gospel as a witness for what he had done to the whole world. Church, we so often forget that the reason why we are here is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, we need to be in fellowship. And yes, all these ancillary things that church is, yes, 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 and yes. But if we forget the gospel, we have forgotten, forgotten why God has called us. And we want to know why there's no revival? I'm telling you right now, it's because we've forgotten what our purpose is. We've forgotten the role of the Holy Spirit in your life. 
And that is to do these seven things we're going to talk about. And we're going to cover them quick because I love going light. Here we go. Let's go through them. You're going to want to know these. You're going to write them down. What is a church on fire? What is a church on fire? Number one, a fire is in a family that speaks. A family on fire speaks. Speaks. Notice what happens in Acts chapter 2. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. They spoke. Chapter 2, verse 14, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. He spoke, men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and give ear of my words. Acts chapter 3, in verse 8, the paralyzed man, when he gets saved, he is walking and leaping and praising, speaking about Jesus. Acts chapter 4 and verse 1, and they were all speaking to the people. The priests and the captains of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them. And notice this, greatly annoyed because they were teaching people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. But Peter and John answered, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than the God you may judge. We cannot but speak of what, he has, what we have seen and heard. Acts chapter 4 verse 20. Man, you want to know what happens in Acts? People speak. You want to know why revival doesn't exist in America today? Christians aren't speaking of Jesus. Simple. Hey, you can clap, you can cry, you can do whatever you want to do. I'm letting you know this is what they did. You see, the mark of the first family on fire was they would not keep silent. You see it throughout the entire book. A family on fire not only does that, but stands boldly. Notice this. Verse, chapter 4, verse 8. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to the rulers of the elders. Now listen to this. If we are being examined today concerning good deeds done by this crippled man that they had just healed, or by what means this man has been healed, notice what they say in verse 10. Let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but when we say boldness, we're talking about looking at somebody and saying, listen, uh, the reason why this guy is healed is because the guy you killed, he was God. What? That's crazy boldness. Notice how they go on to verse 12. And, and there is salvation in none other. In other words, there is no salvation priest in what you're doing, only in Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven on which men, by which men must be saved. Wow. Notice what it says in verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, astonished and recognized that they had been with Jesus. You want to have revival? Speak. You want to have revival? Be bold. Stand up in your workplace. Stand up in your life and say, listen, I will not back down. I will not be ashamed. I do not care what culture says, what media says, what scientists make up. I will stand for what God has to say. Not only that, man, they were a family willing to share. Now, this is crazy talk. This is crazy talk. This is just something you see throughout this early church. Notice Acts chapter 2 and 44. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 5, and they were selling their possessions and belong, uh, bringing dis and distributing the proceeds to all who had need. Verse 34, 32, all were, uh, and now the full number of those who believed were of one soul and one heart. No one said that any of their things belonged to their, themselves, but everything was in common. Generosity was this thing that overtook this church. You want to have revival? Stop being so tied up in your possessions. Why? Not because it was about them giving them. It was because they stopped being a stumbling block, preventing them from sharing the gospel. So often we're so wrapped up in this world, we're so busy doing everything else but the gospel because we've got to have a 401k, we've got to have a job, we've got to do this, we've got to do it. It's all about money. Listen, a family on fire is one that shares possessions. Take a back seat. Christ becomes the center point. What's else, what else happened in this church? Man, a family on fire, they were a family that served. Notice this. 
We're going to talk about this a little in another sermon, but man, notice this about serving. Now in these days, in verse chapter 6 and verse 1, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, wow, wouldn't that be awesome? A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because of their widows were being neglected in daily distribution. And what happened? The 12 disciples got together and they summed, summed the group together and said, what do we do? We can't give up preaching the word. And therefore they picked among them seven men. Listen, in the early church, there was no, uh, there was no struggle to find people willing to fill the roles needed in the church. No, this is why there was no need. Do you understand that? In other words, when we say, hey, we have a need in the nursery, or hey, we have needs in the Sunday school, or hey, we have needs in youth, or we have needs for bus workers, or we have needs here to be greeters, and hey, we need ushers, and it was solved. Like there was no, like, I wonder who's going to do that today. No, it happened. You want to have a fire? You want to have revival? There are no needs in the church because church fills those needs. It's not 10% doing 90% of the work. It's 90% doing all the work. Do you understand that? It was powerful. It was amazing. A church on fire served the Lord, teaching, working, finding what was needed, solving problems, everyone in the church. This was their attitude. Man, not only that, a family on fire was a family that was willing to suffer. This one is hard for me to grasp. Oh my goodness. What made this church on fire? What made it willing to go through walls of trial? It was that they had no fear. They were not afraid of being persecuted. This, this one blows my mind. I'm just gonna read a few of them that happened through Acts. Acts chapter five and verse 40. And when they were called in the apostles... Chapter 40, here we go. They were beat. They beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. I'm talking right off the bat. I mean, the day of Pentecost happens, they go out and start preaching. They start getting beat. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound too exciting. But they had no fear. Notice what they said in verse 41. And they left, left the presence of the council after getting beat, rejoicing that they, that they were counted worthy of the suffering. What? No, no, no. They got beat and said, whoa, we just got beat because of Jesus. That is so amazing. I just lost my job because I shared the gospel. Whoa, that is awesome. Yeah, you're like, uh, what? That, that's what they did. Like, they had no fear. They were not afraid. In verse 42, it says, and, and every day in the temple, and from house to house, they did not cease teaching, even though they were told to stop and that they were going to be beat again. How about Stephen? This is amazing. First martyr. And they were stoning Stephen. He called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. As they're stoning him, he's like, yo, God, peace. I, I don't know about you. I think I would be running. He doesn't do that. He hits, his, 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 he hits his knees, looks to heaven, sees Jesus and says, I'm ready. Wow. Wow. How about Acts 1.8? And there arose on that day great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered through the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Oh, that was because of Paul. But then Paul gets converted. And notice what happens to Paul. And many days had passed, and the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they were watching the gates day and night. I don't know about you, but can you imagine that you preached the gospel so much that the plotting was to kill you? Because you would not be quiet about the gospel. You, you catching on to something? Revival happens when family members, when churches are on fire, when they are on fire. Man, the fire is unquenchable. A family on fire not only does that, but it submits. It submits to do what is tough, not easy, not easy. I'm going to read a long passage here. It's a story of Paul's conversion. Now, I don't know about you, but this is, this guy, this story is just amazing. Here it goes, Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. Let's read it quickly. Here we go. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. 
And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, uh, here I am, Lord. I can hear it now. Uh, yeah, Lord, what's up? The Lord said to him, rise and go to the street that's called Straight and on that how, on, on there will be a house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul and behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias to come and lay hands on him that he might regain his sight. Now notice what Ananias says. He says, uh, uh, Lord, I've heard a lot about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call in your name. But the Lord says to him, go, for he is, chosen, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry on the name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him much, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departs and enters the house. Now, I don't know about you. I, I don't know about you. But when you hear of your enemy who's out to kill you, and God says, hey, listen, uh, I know this guy is about to kill you, but I want you to go into him and say, listen, I just want you to know that God loves you and I'm here to heal your sight. I don't think there's three people in the, I actually, I don't know, in, I don't know any of us. I don't know many of us that are like, oh, like, okay, Lord, death sentence. I'm so excited. Yes, 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 Saul, I'm here. I'm a Christian. Please don't crucify me. We don't think like that. They were so submissive to the Spirit. They were so in tune that when the Spirit said move, they moved. Church, welcome to the family. A family that's on fire. We wonder again why we don't have revival. We pray for a while. We sing for revival. And we don't do revival. We are not churches who do revival seriously. The seventh thing is this, which is what this shirt is all about. They shared the gospel. We've already talked a little bit about it, but they were, a family of fire shares the gospel. They win souls. Notice Acts chapter two. So those who received the word were baptized and there were added day by day 3,000 souls. Note uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 47 says this, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts eleven twenty one, 21, and the hand of the Lord was on them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Acts eleven twenty four, for he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and great many people were added to the Lord. Acts 16, 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in their number. Daily, church, do you understand? If we want to be like the family of God, where we experience the power of God, we've got to do the will of God. We've got to start speaking boldly passionately, willing to suffer, stand out in submission to share the gospel. If we're not bold enough to say, hey, would you come to church with me and hear the gospel? Would you just come to church and hear about Jesus? We're never gonna see revival. It's not gonna happen. And we'll, we're gonna hold account. We're going to be the ones who stand before God when he says, hey, listen, I, I kind of just showed you the model right here. This is what you got to do. Go do that. And you just watch the spirit move. You watch the spirit work. Get out of the way and just do what I say. Get out of the way and do what I say. And see the mighty hand of God. Church, we need to stop praying when we already know what to do. Now you don't take that out of context. I'll, I'll get misquoted on that one. I'm not saying we stop praying, but oftentimes we're praying for the very thing that we already have the answer to. You want revival? 
Do you want to see this city turned upside down? Do you want to be the salt and light and love of Christ? Do you want to see Christ-centered world changers? Do you want to see the world again know Jesus? Do you want to be standing before Jesus as part of a great movement that his spirit did through you? Or do you want to just stand back and let somebody else receive the glory? Because let me tell you something. God's gonna be glorified no matter what. Remember, he'll, he'll have the rocks cry out if he has to. Today, that's my question for you. My question for you. Are you ready to be a family on fire? Are you willing to stand and say, I will? I will no longer hide behind my fears. I will have a Pentecostal moment where the spirit moves on me and produces a spirit-led life. I hope today is the day. Listen, if you're here today, you've never heard the gospel and today you might've heard it for the very first time. Maybe you're here today and you're brokenhearted. You think there's no hope. You think that there's no, there's no future for you. Maybe you feel so burdened with sin. You think I can never be forgiven. I've done too much. Man, that's what this story is all about. That's what this church is all about. That's what the person next to you hopefully is all about or the person on the pew beside you is all about because this is what we're all about. We're all about the gospel of Jesus Christ all about the fact that we're all sinners. We have all fallen short of God's glory and that Jesus, the son of God came down to this earth so we could have a relationship with him and be restored with our creator that we may walk with him and have the abundant life. If you're here today and you have never given your life to Jesus, the Bible says if we'll confess with our mouth that he is Lord, and that we will believe in our heart that he has risen from the dead, that he has conquered death. You, my friend, can be saved. You can be saved. Would you do that today?